So taking an English language test can be a pretty nerve-wracking experience, right? And sometimes if you become too nervous, it can sort of cloud your thinking. If you suffer from this, then you should listen to this podcast that I did with a guy called Harley DeVos, who's a performance psychologist. We talked about different strategies on how to tackle anxiety and test performance. So check it out. Hello everybody, my name is Jay. I'm one of the expert teachers here at E2 Language and today I'm chatting to a sports psychologist named Harley DeVos. How's it going, Harley? I'm very well, thanks, Jay. How are you? Yeah. Some of you might be thinking, why would I want to be talking to a sports psychologist when we prepare people for English language exams? And the reason is, I think there's great overlap between what athletes do and what test candidates do. Obviously, test candidates do it luckily only just do it sort of once or twice, um, but there's certainly some overlap there. Uh, Harley, can you just uh, introduce yourself if you don't mind? Yep, certainly. Um, firstly, um, just a minor correction, I'm a performance psychologist, not a uh -huh. sport. Right. Um, I'm actually doing the registrar program to become an endorsed um, sport psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a, a master's degree in, in sport and exercise psychology, but um, I guess just in the interest of uh, using proper titles, sure. I call myself a performance psychologist, but at the moment, uh, or a sport and exercise psychology registrar, um, but not a sports psychologist. So uh, that's my background. So currently, um, I work uh, for a company called Condor Performance, um, and we provide sport and performance psychology services to athletes and performers. Um, we work with individual athletes, we work with coaches, we work with teams. Um, and this work um, is both with athletes and performers based in Australia, but also globally as well. Um, one of the, I guess, advantages of, of being in 2020, and, and especially it's been probably amplified on the back of um, COVID-19, is that, you know, with um, all the technology that's available now, uh, you don't have to be physically in the same place as someone anymore to be able to access those services. Nice. So yep. we do a lot of work with that work with a whole host of um, athletes and performers from from different sports um, and I'm also I've just started a, a PhD uh, which is in sports psychology um, which I'm doing through the University of Newcastle and that's in partnership with the Australian Institute of Sport. Nice and what's your focus in your PhD? Uh, it's looking at athlete performance health we're calling it mm -hmm. um, and sort of a, there'll be a focus on uh, mental health and on sleep and on, I suppose, developing strategies to optimise those with a view to improving athletes' recovery um, and also helping from a psychological point of view to reduce time away from training that athletes spend because of injury and illness. Mm. So, you know, one of the big things that we, we know is there's a really strong link between uh, physically our health mm. and mentally our health and that sort of mind-body connection and so you're looking at yeah, from a psychological point of view how we can improve um, athletes health so that they can train more frequently um, and I guess the more time that athletes are able to train uh, and the less time that they spend absent from training through injury and illness um, the greater that they're likely to be able to produce their uh, best performances when it really mounts nice. and um, yeah so it's sort of in, in that space that we're that we're looking yeah, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, the physical and the mental, they're, they're obviously so tightly interlinked, aren't they? Yes. All right, so the way that I thought we might um, structure this talk is to talk about uh, what our candidates should be doing pre-exam uh, yep. in, in the months or days or uh, uh, leading up to their test. I then want to talk about what they should be doing on the day of their exam. Uh, and you mentioned sleep there, which, is, which will be a part of that. Uh, obviously the night before, hopefully not during the exam. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I want to also talk about uh, their performance and their uh, what's going on during the exam itself. And I should just also mention here that I've taken these tests myself. myself. Uh, these tests are very high stakes. Uh, that's why I wanted to talk to someone about performance. Um, and they can be very anxiety provoking. And one of the things that happens when you get very anxious before an exam or during an exam is that it inhibits your cognition. Um, obviously, this is different than sport because you're 
I suspect you're focusing more on the, how it affects your physical performance. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Here we're really thinking about, you're not so worried about your physical performance in an exam, obviously, but certainly worried about how you know, you're, you're reading that text and are you able to concentrate on that text? Are you able to uh, comprehend that text or, or speak? I guess there is a physical aspect to speaking, stuff like that. What do you yeah, think look, there? I think, I mean, I think one of the things about performance um, is that it's so intertwined between the physical and the psychological. And mm. I guess in some sports, um, you know, there's certainly an external element where it's perceived to be a very physical sport and you know in in a 100 meter sprint the person who can run the fastest is going to win mm -hmm. um, of course what actually allows that person to run the fastest is often based on psychological underpinnings you know those that can deal with pressure the best in the moment of the olympic final for example so yeah, yeah. it's you know the person who makes the least mistakes or that can be the most focused is mm. who's going to in that sense. So certainly from that, um, and I guess, you know, if we're talking about it from a pure exam point of view, um, there's a much higher uh, cognitive and intellectual component there, but there's still a lot of the principles are the same. There's still the capacity to talk. Uh, if it's writing, you've still got to, still got to write and, and deal with that. And mm. we know that, you know, anxiety in a performance setting can certainly uh, significantly impact, um, you know, even both most basic mo uh, motor skills, um, you know, such as such as talking. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of us will have experienced at some point doing a whether it's a presentation in in a classroom mm. or delivering a, a speech in a, in a public space where you get so anxious that it's actually really hard to get the words out. Absolutely, so it's yeah. definitely that, that physical component there as well. Oh, it's fascinating, isn't it? Really, really interesting stuff. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, I think people underestimate how much this can impact test performance. You know, um, even native English speakers who go and take these tests can, can experience this as well. And all of a sudden, their language skills, which are native, natural, are inhibited. And, and also, language is just one of those weird things where some days you wake up and you speak like a poet. Other days you wake up and you struggle to get a sentence out too. So there's a lot of variability just in, in day to day uh, life with your language abilities as well. All right, let's start with pre-exam. What, what do you think uh, our exam candidates should be doing sort of leading up to their test? Let's say a week out from their test. A week out. So I think the, the key thing to, to performing well uh, in most situations is you want to get your work done early. Mm. So, you know, the classic saying, um, proper preparation prevents poor performance. So really, I suppose, focusing on that, having really strong uh, study habits is, is really important so that's where you know a good routine can be um, recognizing within yourself when you study the best so some of us you know wait if we wake up in the early in the morning and the first thing that we do is sort of hit the books for a couple of hours because that's when we're at our um, our best mentally we might be at our sharpest and things like that others okay I might need to sort of ease my way into the day before I do it but certainly uh, you know, developing really strong study habits uh, is, is a really important first step, I think, um, that needs to be built up. Uh, obviously, the more that you know, the more confidence that you can take that you can perform at your best. Mm. So that's a really important thing. And, you know, I think there's a, an element there, uh, which, you know, if we look at it from a performance side, when we watch athletes and we watch top performers um, do their thing you know for the for the average person this kind of that or like wow they're so amazing but what you overlook is the fact that they have put in so much hard work to get to that point yeah and that's the that's the key thing about performance is you've got to work really hard so you know when it comes to preparing for an exam you've got to put in the work you're not going to fuck it so i think that's a really important uh first step that you've got to actually do the work. Good call. Yeah, that's music to my ears. We're all about preparation at E2 Language, so that's yeah. that's great. Yeah, really, you have to start building up your endurance as well. Uh, one of the things with these exams is they go for about three hours, and you know, if you if you're studying bits and pieces here and there for ten minutes or twenty minutes, it's a whole different ball game when you're into the you know the the, the last bit of the exam. You know, the 
end of the second hour of the exam and it's in the listening section and you're, 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 you, it really is a test of endurance. So that preparation for endurance is really important too. Um, what would you say about preparing? Um, it, it, it's, it's a good idea to prepare when you're feeling good and when you've had a nice you know, cup of tea and you relax and you sit down at the computer and you're you know, burning incense or whatever you're doing to make yourself feel good. But yeah. on, ex on the ex exam day, you, you may not be feeling good. So would you recommend that pe uh, people prepare when they're tired or hungry or in other states? Abs absolutely. Like that's really music to my ears. Um, definitely you want to spend some of the time doing your preparation um preparing when yeah when things are really difficult for you when mm. you're not at best when as you say when you are tired or when you're when you're hungry or whatever it is um because absolutely right on exam day we can't guarantee that you're going to feel at your very best mm. and one of the important things in performance is you don't have to feel your best to perform your best so there's a there's a big difference nice. between those between those two. So absolutely, doing practicing when you're not feeling well is really really important. So definitely, we want to be doing that um, at least some of the time. You know, some of the ways that I guess can help that um, for some people that might be studying in the evening at the end of the day when they're mm. when they're really tired or you know putting in. A solid block of, of study before dinner when they're when they're hungry and just being able to deal with yeah deal with that um doing some study when you don't want to do it you know yeah. when your mind's protesting and it's telling you to go and do other things but actually just sort of sitting down and doing that is is really important so that you you know develop uh experience mm. at being able to produce the work when you don't feel like it great yeah, I mean, I remember taking the IELTS test and you have to, I had to get up at about 7 a.m. to get to the testing centre and then I had to wait in line for hours. I can't remember what I ate for breakfast, but, you know, then the first cab off the rank is the writing test where you have to write, you know, a 250-word essay um, and, and other bits and pieces. And that's, that's at 9 o'clock in the morning. And um, I, I really thought to myself, wow, I, I, you know, how many people wake up and write essays? That doesn't happen. So that would be a really good practice to wake up and you know, get in that mindset yeah i think there's a lot to be said for being able to to try and replicate exam like conditions as part of your study so Good that's the same thing so doing some work at the time so yeah if you've got an early morning exam or practice getting up getting out of bed getting ready and doing study at that time so that that becomes a little bit of a, of a routine for you i think that's that's really important yeah Oh, yep, absolutely. What about, you know, most people are okay, they get a few jitters and they're, um, you know, they, they manage through whatever, it, it's not such a big deal. But we do have some people who write in and they genuinely suffer anxiety issues. Um, what about, what sort of practices, do you recommend practices like mindfulness meditation or uh, physical exercise? How can these people leading up to their exams sort of calm their nerves? Yes, yeah, so look, certainly, um, you know, for anyone that is struggling with um, an underlying mental health issue, it's important to know that there is help available and there's, and there's really good help and support out there. So certainly for anyone who's in that uh, category, I would strongly encourage you to, to go and speak to someone. Um, it may be someone like, like myself who, you know, has an interest in performance, mm. but also has a strong interest in, in mental health, or it might be someone who specialises in an anxiety disorder or, or something else. But that's really important um, that we want to sort of work on that. But if we're talking about general, uh, I guess, performance anxiety and how to manage those nerves, um, certainly the, the mindfulness med and meditations and, and guided uh, exercises and, and relaxation can be really helpful. Um, what I would caution against, though, is if people aren't already familiar with that, it's probably not a good, good mm. idea to start doing it. So we don't really want to be introducing anything new right before a major performance because that can actually be detrimental to performance. So for those that have experience in that, absolutely, that's a really good practice to maintain. But if you, if you haven't and it's only a few days before the exam, don't start don't, now. Don't go on a meditation retreat. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing that. Um, <laughs> Fair what enough. I think can help, you know, certainly um, movement is, is really important. And yeah. so I guess 
you know, in the days leading up to the exam, part of that daily routine should be some form of, of moving your body. That's really important, whether that's going for a walk or going to the gym or, you know, having a hit of tennis with a friend, doing a dance class, well, if, you, if you can do them at the moment, uh, but whatever it is that it is. So moving your body is really important. We know that's a really great way for us to uh, reduce stress. Um, when we, when we move, um, it helps our body to metabolize cortisol, which is our stress hormone. So that's really important. And then also we know that uh, movement is really important for cognition. Okay, it helps with learning and with memory. Um, so definitely doing something every day is gonna be really important. Yep. Um, you know, in terms of, I guess, closer to the exam or on the day of the exam, um, what can be really helpful is deep breathing and knowing how to deep breathe. Mm. Uh, you know, deep breathing is, is really effective physiologically at actually changing uh, our brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we, we know is when we are in a stressful situation, such as an exam, our threat system is activated. Our, our part of our brain gets activated and that's when we start to see our heart rate increase, our breathing gets mm -hmm. shallower and faster, our digestive system shuts down, which is why we can experience the, the butterflies in the tummy, mm. we become sweaty, we might become jittery. Um, so they're all the physical signs we experience. Plus there's also the cognitive element with the sort of the worrying and the catastrophizing mm. our thinking. So breathing is really good because it actually helps us to switch um, which parts of our brain are activated. A little bit like when we're anxious, it's like our foot's on the accelerator. Mm. Okay. But to perform really well in an exam, we need the brakes on. So we need to slow it down. So breathing is really good for that. Um, a little useful exercise that can help is what we call box breathing. And this is simply just to breathe in through your nose for four seconds, hold that breath for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, hold that for four seconds and repeat that. And it's just like you're going around a box for those who are very visual, they might want to imagine that box just in front of them. And that can just be a nice way um, just to help slow down the breathing, which is really important. So that's that's one aspect. Um, the other thing which I think is also important to acknowledge is that exams are difficult and they are stress provoking mm. situations and they're designed in many ways intentionally to do that. And so part of it is also I guess, a, a willingness to tolerate discomfort, That's right. knowing that this exam is going to be difficult, but it's really important for me to do that because it's it's going to help me uh, with future studies or with, you know, other aspects of my life. So it's really important that I do this exam and I'm willing to sit with the discomfort that I might experience along the way in order of working towards what's important for me. So, well, well said. Yeah, I'm a big fan of acceptance, just saying, you know yeah. what? My, my, my heart's going to flutter. My stomach will feel terrible. My hands will sweat. Who cares? I'll get over it. That's, that's okay. That's normal. Oh, that's mm. just my body responding to a threat. It's okay. I'm here to do a job yep. and I'm going to do that. Yeah, good one. Well said. All right. So what about sort of night before the exam with diet uh, and sleep? What, what do you have to say about that? Yeah. So again, we don't want to change anything a day or two days before. So we want to keep doing our same routine. So um, hopefully, you know, everyone has a, a good sleep routine where they go to bed at the same time every night and they wake at the same time. And if they're not, it's probably a good idea to be doing that. And particularly, you know, a few days before the exam. So if you've got a 9am exam mm -hmm. and you know you have to be up at 6.30 in the morning so that you can have something to eat and you can get to the exam, then practice getting up at 6.30, you know, a week before, the longer the better, so that you just consistently waking at that time and um, weekends and and with that then you also want to try and set a bedtime that's the same so it might be you know 10 10 p.m or whatever um that's the time that i'm that i'm going to bed i'm going to sort of build that into my routine so we want to keep that the same i have heard um anecdotally from some athletes that for them they find the sleep two nights before their competition is the one that they most want to get right. Right, so, interesting. Um, because of the night before things can happen or whatever, and we again, we can perform in the short term, 
even if we haven't slept well. Yep. So if they can nail it two nights before, then at least they've had a really good sleep and a good rest and they know that they'll be right to go. Mm. So making that sleep a priority is really important. But certainly the night before, I think what is really important is you want to do your last revision of notes. Um, you don't want to be studying any new material that close because that's going to impact performance. So hopefully it's just a revision of notes and you want to give yourself a really good break. So it's about, yeah, okay, I agree. I've reviewed my notes. I've done what I can. I'm ready to go. That, I remember in high school, basically having that attitude. It's just like, there's nothing more I can do now. So yeah. I may as well just chill out, watch a movie, relax. That's exactly right. So that's really important. So I'd encourage people to do that, to be uh, switching off um, and, and really trying to relax and unwind the night before. Uh, making sure that there's, you know, a, a period of time, probably at least 30 minutes, ideally 60 before bed, where you're not on any devices, um, just to help sleep. Make sure that your room is a good space for sleep is, is really important as well, that it's cool, it's dark, it's quiet. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, as, as free from clutter as much as possible. Um you know, we're not studying in bed or anything like that because that's going to impact it. So certainly that unwinding process uh, is really important. Mm. Uh, I think that's a big thing. And the other thing that's also important in this is if you are really anxious the night before an exam and you can't sleep, don't spend long periods of time laying in bed not sleeping. Because mm -hmm. what we do is we actually condition our mind that that's what we do. We go to bed and we just lay there and we think. So give yourself 20 minutes, half an hour max. And if you're not asleep, come up, get out of bed, go into a different room, do something that's really quiet and not stimulating. Maybe it's reading or some coloring or some journaling or listen to some really sort of soft calming music. And there's some really great soundtracks that you can get, you know, sounds of rain on the roof and, and things like that be really good. Um, Again, be aware of, of caffeine and how much caffeine you have too close to bed. Yep. Um, you know, for those that do enjoy a cup of tea or coffee, um, caffeine before you perform can, mm. can help increase alertness and can help. There's a, there is a, a, an effect there. So certainly, you know, if you're someone who likes a coffee in the morning like I am, well, have your coffee in the morning before the exam. That's, that's important to do. Um, but don't have, you know, the coffee probably at, at dinner time because you might yeah. not be able to so yeah and and probably don't introduce any any new foods into your diet the night before or just a, you know certain foods i would i would avoid like chili you know you know obvious things like that that's that's right if if anyone has any um sensitivities or intolerances to certain foods be steering clear of them yeah. um you know the night before so yes eating just a normal healthy meal is yeah. is really good um so i'd encourage you to do that don't eat too close to, to going to bed. Yeah. Um, you give your, your body a chance to actually start digesting and processing that food before you go to bed. Yeah. So that's really important. So you want to eat something that's that's wholesome, um, you know, that has good proteins, plenty of plenty of vegetables there, yeah. um, some, some good fats and carbohydrates in that. So just just eating what you would would normally. Nice, good one. All right, let's imagine it's on the day the alarm goes off. Um, what 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 do you recommend first thing up? Oh, look, I think, I mean, everyone has different, some people have very deliberate and structured morning routines, yep. some yep. don't, but certainly, um, you know, it's important between waking and getting ready for the exam that you've had a really good um, filling breakfast so that, you know, hopefully you're not going to go into the exam hungry, also that your blood sugars are, are stable. We don't really want them crashing exam because we know so nothing you know too too sugary uh so you know it might be a smoothie with some some fruit and um greek yogurt or you know in the winter months good porridge or oatmeal something like that that's going to sort of give you sustained energy beforehand is, is really important yeah it's not going to be too sensitive in the in the tummy and cause you any issues there so having breakfast if you do like you know a cup of tea or coffee in the morning yep. have that and give yourself time to have that um Good idea to drink plenty of water as well. You want to sort of be hydrated as you go into the exam as well, because we know dehydration yeah. affects your ability to, to think. Yeah, good one. Good. All right, yeah, so don't change it up too much. 
that that makes sense. Big breakfast. I'm a big fan of. I, I like healthy fats. You know, avocado stuff like that. That seems to sustain Perfect. my energy for a long time. Avocado on toast, maybe with with an egg or without right. an egg. Yeah, would be ideal. Um, this one is is more my own personal experience, more so than anything I know um, from science. But for me, when I was always doing exams at uni, I always had this motto that if I looked good, then I would feel good, and if I felt good, then I could perform nice. better. Yeah. So, so for me, making sure that you know I, I had a shower, had a shave, yep. um, put on, put on jeans, and I like it. I wasn't I wasn't rocking up in my trackies and UGG boots. <laughs> and that was something that was important for me. Yeah. And for others, that, that might be important as Good well. One. No, so, I, I like it. I think I think you're gotta... taking a bit of pride in how you look. You don't have to wear a dinner suit to the exam, but just Good you know work. something. Yeah. You're, you're smart and casual. You're going to be probably think about um, different layers in case it's really cold in the exam room or in the hall, wherever it's done, yeah. or if it's really hot. So yeah. that's really important as well that you sort of dress depending on the conditions yeah. um, because it's too hot or too cold, that might impact your ability to perform well. For sure. Yeah. I think also, you know, you want to make sure you've got your transport organized. The testing center might be far away. Make sure you've got your Uber booked or, you, you know, which train station you're getting off at. Even doing that, if you know, the week before, just so you, you know what that routine is. You don't want any surprises on the day of the exam. You certainly don't want to rock up late. Or, no. as I did once, rock up and realize that I hadn't actually booked the test itself. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, you want, to, you want to make sure you've, you've done all that sort of stuff right. So, You've got that, um, you give yourself plenty of time, I think is really important. So in the event that, you know, the trains aren't running, for example, if you're taking public transport, yeah. you've got to get an Uber and still get there. That's um, right. You're better off being at the exam center early and having to sit around rather than rushing in late. So we wanna just try and eliminate as much stress as possible. And again, doing all that stuff, doing it early, having your, your research done early, knowing where you have to go, how you're gonna get there, how long it's gonna take, that's really important. Yeah. One of the things you have to do when you take one of these tests is sit in the waiting room. And I see people with sort of notes, they're doing their last minute cramming. But one thing I like to do is actually take a pen and a piece of paper and just start writing. Um, I find when I, when I just start writing off the bat with no, uh, how can I say this, after a few sentences or a few paragraphs, I start to get in the rhythm. My brain starts to get in the, in the writing rhythm. So obviously, you know, it's a bit like warming up before the exam. I think that's really helpful just to practice writing an essay in the waiting room, just casually, not putting pressure on yourself, but just getting those those bloods flowing. Yeah, look, that's that's a great idea, and I think particularly when it's the focus is on actually the writing, yeah, rather than the content is is really important that's as well. It. Yeah. Um, personally, I'd probably be discouraging people from sort of reading notes, like if you're in the waiting room. Yeah, waiting to I the agree. Not, you're not going to gain anything at that point. I agree. Point. It's too late. You don't know all the time you get into the waiting room. Yeah, you're not it. ready to do it, and that's not going to that's not going to help. And yeah. if anything, it's going to uh, actually hinder your your performance. So you've got to get all your study done before. That's right. Some of these tests are also paper based tests, and you have to write your essay with a pencil. Um, that was a real shock to me the first time I had to do that. I'm, I hadn't written with a grey lead pencil since I was in grade six at school. Um, and I actually didn't really, I, I mean, I had the strength, but I tell you what, my hand was getting pretty sore. My handwriting was getting pretty messy by the end of it. And I think a good practice would have been to actually write a couple of essays or do my preparation with a grey lead pencil. That would have been helpful. Look, that's that's a really great point. And, and definitely, certainly if, if you can know as much about the exam before you're going to do it so that you can prepare accordingly. So, yeah, if it's yeah. going to be done with a, with a grey lead pencil, we'll practice writing with a grey lead pencil. Good one. Um, I think you can buy those little um, grips that you can put on them. So possibly if, if you're allowed to bring something like that in, put it in your pocket, then if you do have to write with a pencil, at least that might help yeah. you just keep your hands uh, from, from you know cramping and, and tightening up, so to speak. So uh, little things like that's really important. But definitely you want to be practicing what you're going to have to do in the exam, you know, in the days before you go into the exam. Good one. All right, let's imagine you're in the exam room and you can open your test booklets and begin writing or begin reading or whatever it is you're doing. Um, let's say somebody's at this stage, let's say it's the reading section, and this is where emotion can really affect cognition when it comes to reading. I've, I've experienced this. I'll give you a, a funny little example. I was teaching the other day. I, I teach online these live classes, and I think there was about 250 people 
watching me as I was explaining this, the answer to this multiple choice question. Um, and I totally forgot what the answer was. And I had to work it out in front of 250 people as they watched me. And all of a sudden my mind just shut down. I couldn't read that paragraph properly. It's like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I had to just say to the students, oh, listen, I'll just come back to this in a minute, you know, bought myself some time, but that can certainly happen. What would you recommend to people when they're, you know, they're, they're looking at the paragraph and it's just not making sense to them because of there's too much emotion, too much anxiety going through their mind. I, I certainly think when you sort of go in and, and sit down, um, that's a really good opportunity to have a couple of those deep breaths. We talked before about the box breathing. So that's a really good thing just to sort of try and really calm and, and center yourself in, in that moment. I think that's really important. Yeah. Then when you start reading, um, again, maybe having a breath before you actually start. Yeah. And if you find that you you're reading something and it's not making sense or you can't read it, just stop, take a moment and then come back to it or, or move on to a different section. And, and, you know, I think that's really important. So you don't want to spend too long on something that you're not being able to comprehend and not understand. Yeah. Is that turning on a further increase in the anxiety you might be feeling? So taking that time, um, possibly something you could do before the exam and you can certainly do once you're in the exam is, you know, we talked earlier about movement and how important that is, or we can still move, you know, even if we're seated, we can still stretch um, and things like that. And just taking a little bit of time, either in reading time or throughout the exam, just to do that is really important as well. So, you know, if you started reading a section in reading time and you find it really hard to comprehend, well, maybe just put it down for a moment, have a quick stretch, move the arms around, just sort of shake your legs out, have a slow controlled calming breath and then try again i and agree see, man i think you know that those those breaths that you take where you become really you know conscious and aware that can really just stop that sort of compounding mechanism of the of the mind when it starts yep. to spin out of control definitely can, even you know some people sometimes just you know shutting your eyes for a moment and then reopening them and just allowing yourself to refocus can also help yeah yeah good stuff good um, all right. What about just maintaining attention, maintaining concentration throughout this throughout this exam? Um, I, I I think obviously we've had a good breakfast. That's going to help a lot. What else is there that we can do to to f keep the focus? So I think what's important to realise if if you've had an exam and it's going to go for three hours, you're not going to be able to sustain your attention for that whole time. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we just know that humans. Um, don't concentrate for that for that length of time. So what helps, I think, is to just break it down into like smaller chunks. So you might do it per question or per section. Yep. And so you might work on um, focusing on, you know, you've got to you've got to write a short essay. So it's okay. I'm going to focus on that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write that, and then I'm just going to give myself a minute after that yeah. just to stop to breathe, just to move a little bit. And then I'm going to go on to the next section. And so we actually break it down into chunks. And I think that's a really helpful thing to do. Um, I know, again, another personal thing that I used to do, and depending on the exam conditions where this is allowed, but I, in exams, would always take what I would call a tactical toilet break. So in the middle of the exam, whether or not I needed to go to the bathroom, I would just go and I would just give myself two, three minutes out of the exam room, maybe splash a little bit of cold water on the face, just reset, refocus, an opportunity to get the blood flowing because you're moving around and then coming back in yeah. and going again. And for me, I always found that the time that I would lose by doing that, I would gain because I was able to sustain my attention for longer. So something like that I think is really important. So don't, I suppose my advice would be don't think that you have to sit in your seat for the whole three hours and do the exam from start to finish that we can break it up we can break it down and if you do need to get out and come back in that can actually be really really valuable so well that would be something i would consider um, but again using our you know using our breathing um, is also really important during during that exam as well um, just being able to take those those calming centering breaths just to reset and yeah i think breaking it down into smaller sections. One helps to reduce the complexity of the task, which makes it a little bit easier for us to do. Um, you know, Jay, if, if you and I were gonna go and, and climb um, Mount Kilimanjaro, for example, 
and we stand at the bottom, we look at the top and we think, wow, that's really high, that's really long, I don't think we can do it. You're forgetting the fact that you have to take individual steps to get to that point. And if we start focusing on those individual steps, eventually we get to the top. Good one. Yeah. So then we can apply that similar principle when it comes to an exam that sometimes we we lose sight of what we actually have to do because we get overwhelmed by the complexity of the task. But if we actually think, okay, I've got this section to do, then I've got this section and then I've got that section, well, I'll just break them down and I can, and I can do that. I can do one section and then I can do the next section. Great. Well said. You know, the, uh, the, the biggest uh, way that candidates will screw up their test in the writing section is not their grammar, it's not their vocabulary range, it's actually writing off topic. Because what candidates typically do or what they can do is, you know, they're in such a rush, you know, it's like, go, bang. And then they'll, they'll quickly read the question prompt, not read it properly. They'll scribble out an essay without sort of, as you mentioned, which I think is a great point, you know, stopping after the first paragraph, the introduction and going, okay, does that make sense? How am I going to link the second paragraph? Writing that one, looking at the question prompt again, you know, just doing it stage by stage. Well said. Yeah. And I think even on that, um, you know, from, from when I was at, at school, when I had to, to write essays and exams, um, you know, we, some of the advice I received was always spend a couple of minutes actually making a little plan for yeah. what you're going to say and how you're going to say sure. it. And I think, again, that time that if you can spend a moment or two just jotting down some ideas about what's really important, that will save you time. And that helps to ensure that you're actually what you're writing is on topic. Um, because there'd be nothing worse than writing a really great essay, but it's not relevant to the question that's been asked. That's it. That's it. Okay, cool. The other one, and I guess the last bit is um, uh, talking about the speaking section. Why this freaks candidates out is because uh, when they're dealing with the listening, the reading and the writing, they're dealing with a piece of paper. It's in front of them, right? But then all of a sudden they're, they're now dealing in the speaking section with another human being, with what's called an interlocutor, someone who's going to be uh, asking them questions and responding to them. Um, this is an interesting one. I guess it differs between exams. Some other exams like PT, you're actually speaking to a computer, which people find very helpful. That can actually, uh, you know, they prefer that to speaking to a person. My recommendation for this one is that these IELTS examiners, for example, uh, they've seen all sorts of people come through and they've seen people in all sorts of states of mind, right? And they're professionals. If you're shaking or quivering or whatever, that's not what they're worried about. That's not what they're paying attention to. They're paying attention to your language. Um, so if you do find yourself in a situation where you know, you're know you having anxiety that's completely normal, as we said before, I think just sort of accepting it and going, you know what, my hands are shaking. I can't maintain eye contact. Whatever's going on, it doesn't really matter. You know, That's not what you're being scored on there. But um, do you have any last suggestions about the speaking section when they're in front of a person? What, what would you recommend there? Yeah, look, I, I think that, that big part about accepting is, is really important. Recognising it will be a challenge. Um, again, trying to do as much practice as you can beforehand to pre prepare for that. So mm -hmm. talking with different people, practising, getting used to that, um, trying to make that, I guess, as pressurize as you can so it yeah. might be, you know doing it when you're tired doing it when you're hungry um doing it with someone you don't know getting them to make up material that you're not aware yeah. of yeah whatever all that sort of stuff so that you get used to doing that uh, i think probably when you're actually in the moment um, what i would say is it's okay to have a breath and a pause mm. before responding so you know what i would imagine would probably happen a lot of time is someone starts talking to you and your mind starts to think, okay, what do I need to say? What do I need to say? And then you start talking and maybe it's not coming out as you'd like, or you've lost track of words. And it's like a bit of a snowball. It just spirals and it just gets worse and worse mm -hmm. dealing with. So actually take a time to, to pause and process what you've been said, mm -hmm. what's been said to you, sorry, before, the you then respond because so yep. that would be probably my advice and again just trying to sort of really slow things down even if you're just buying yourself half a second or a second that can be enough time for your brain to actually compute what it is that you need to say so 
I guess get your brain to work before your mouth is probably going to be really helpful in that setting, I would imagine. It, it's good to really pay attention to the other person because your body is going to be going through all sorts of physiological whatever's going on, swirls and whirls and twists and turns and stuff like that. But if you're paying attention to the person asking you the question, really you know, putting your concentration on understanding what they're saying, your body can do its thing, that's fine, but and you'll uh, respond appropriately, which is, uh, look, which is really absolutely important. Absolutely right. And there's something to be said where if you can make your focus a little bit more outward, yes. so directed on the other person, you know, what are they saying? And what's my job? My job is to relay the information that I have to yeah. them uh, or to engage with them in a conversation. And that's my job. And if we can just move that shift, that uh, focus, then it helps take it off the fact that you might be really anxious and uncomfortable in that moment mm. but you become less aware of it yeah. because your focus is now on them and what they're saying which then actually helps you to do what you need to do that's it that's it yeah yeah well said it's it's quite interesting like i do a bit of meditation and um one of the things that i've uh, become aware of is how often my body can be in pain but i'm just not aware of it and because I'm not paying attention to it, it doesn't really matter. There's all sorts of pain shooting around my body and my shoulders. In fact, if I pay attention now, it's like, actually my shoulders are quite sore. But up until that point, it didn't matter because I wasn't focusing on that. I was focusing on having a conversation and whatever I was doing at work earlier. Yeah, cool. Um, great, all right, this has been a really, really good talk. I think this has been full of helpful bits of information for um, for these people who, who do have to take this high stakes exam, and it is high stakes, they've got you know um, their visas or their university entrance writing on it, and we're very uh, empathetic, sym sympathetic to that. Um, any last things you'd like to say? Yeah, look, probably the, the last thing, um, I guess from my point of view is, it's really important to believe in yourself. Good one. So, you know, you've earned the right to sit these exams because of what you've done beforehand. And not everyone gets that opportunity. So um, the All Blacks have a saying uh, that pressure is a privilege. Nice. And the idea being that if you find yourself in a situation where you feel pressure, it's actually a privilege because you've earned the right to feel that pressure. And I, I think in many ways sitting exam relates quite well to that, that idea that, I've earned the right to be here. And so, yes, it is going to be stressful because it's a high stakes uh, situation, yeah. but I've earned the right to do that. So I think that's really important. Um, you know, believing in yourself, trusting your processes. So, you know, trusting that you've done the work that will get you there is really important. And so that's where we talked earlier about, you know, having really good preparation and good study habits early. Totally. Is important because that's what gives us confidence that that's I trust that I've done the work that now I can deliver when it counts. So I think that's really important. And the final thing as well is I think just really to, to embrace the challenge and to try and enjoy that experience. Yeah. And yes, it's difficult, but if you can try and enjoy it and see it as an, it's an opportunity. And I think that's really important. A lot of difficult situations we perceive as, a threat to whether or not you know we we get a visa or we can get into a university and that makes it really hard but if we can start to see it as a challenge and as an opportunity that just shifts our mindset slightly and allows us to accept the difficulty that we'll face to accept those nerves that are going to be there and the self-doubt but allow us to do what we need to do to get the performance that we need yeah great man cool got to kick the exams ass that's what it's about that's exactly right. <laughs> Good stuff. Harley, thanks so much for, for chatting today. It was really interesting. No, thanks. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Joe. I've really enjoyed it. And, and hopefully uh, for the listeners out there, they can pick something uh, out of this and that will help them with their exams. Good stuff. Cool. Hopefully you found that conversation helpful. I certainly thought it was very interesting. Now, just keep in mind that a lot of confidence comes from good preparation. So keep studying on E2 language.